today I will share some ideas about the global African diaspora and the pending Kenyan-led invasion of Haiti. The U.S. wants to limit immigration into the country. And they know that if they send U.S. soldiers to Haiti, the U.S. will be culpable for the Haitian migrants who are pushed out. Enter Kenya, a country that is literally over 20 hours away from Haiti. So whatever happens in Haiti in relationship to the Kenyan, um, to the U.S. finance Kenyan invasion, Haitians are not going to be coming to your borders. Second, poor libations in form of tears for yourself. Some of the men and women who will be going will not come back, and we need to prepare to honor their memory. In continental Africa, we know of many Islamist extreme groups. In East Africa, we have Al-Shabaab. In West Africa, we have Boko Haram. When, when young people do not have employment or education options, they get recruited in droves. So there is a holiday in the U.S. called Kwanzaa, and it uses Swahili and principles from East Africa to unite us under pan-African principles. Invasion is not a pan-African principle. They called him Bukma because he was always carrying around a Quran. So he was the book man. Okay, but people who are willing to sacrifice pigs when they're Muslims are not going to tolerate imperialism that is dressed in the face of a brother or a sister. Immigrants come into the country, not because the U.S. does not like immigrants, but the immigration debate loses elections. So your sons and daughters who will be going to Haiti, they're going to Haiti for an election process that has nothing to do with Kenyan lives. Poor libations in form of tears for yourself. Some of the men and women who will be going will not come back, and we need to prepare to honor their memory. Right, yes, we have four speakers. That is Professor Humphrey Obora from the African Federation for Gifted and Talented slash DLC Education. And then we have our Madam Professor Natalie Pierre. She'll correct me how to pronounce her second name from Howard University in the United States of America or the great US of A. And then we have our engineer Felix Odida who is right next to her. And then we have Suba Chacho, who is a human rights advocate. But uh, before we say anything else, I'm going to allow uh, Professor Natalie Pierre uh, to introduce herself uh, to you guys, and you can get to know her before we get to the question of the day. So just a pass the microphone to you. Yes. Uh, you'll sit there. You don't have to stand so that you... Yes, absolutely. Hello? Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. You pronounced my name correctly. It's Natalie. 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 Pierre. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Got it. Journalism things. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Forgive me. I just arrived from New York yesterday morning, so I'm very exhausted. But I'm so thrilled to be back in Kenya for the second time. So thank you to Nick Ogutu for inviting me to the African Education and Immigration Conference. Nick and I met at a fundraiser for the Flamboyant Haitian Literacy Project. Flamboyant is an immigration, excuse me, is an immigrant education advocacy group in New York City that partners with teenaged Haitian migrants who are English language learners and students with interrupted formal education. Due to internal political instability and externally imposed economic chokeholds, Haitians must abandon home. Migrant teens are likely not at the appropriate grade level for their age when they get to the U.S. This often means this vulnerable demographic gets pushed out of high school once they turn 18. I say they are vulnerable not because they are Haitian, but because young people without an education have a limited employment option and makes them susceptible to joining gangs or militant organizations that shred the fabric of society. So for example, on continental Africa, we know of many Islamist extreme groups. In East Africa, we have Al-Shabaab. In West Africa, we have Boko Haram. When, when young people do not have employment or education options, they get recruited in droves. 
So I want to thank all of the educators and civil servants in this audience who helped steer our young people away from such fates. Today I will share some ideas about the global African diaspora and the pending Kenyan-led invasion of Haiti. The African diaspora begins on continental Africa itself with various migratory streams starting from the birth of humankind to the current migrant crisis that affects every part of this continent. One of the largest streams of the African diaspora on the continent are Bantu speakers. So you all are Swahili speakers, you understand that Swahili is part of the Bantu language family, and so are most of the languages in West Africa. So the spread of Bantu languages from West to East South Africa, that constitutes the African diaspora in Africa. And as we know, the name Africa is an externally imposed name. So those people who were speaking Bantu languages did not recognize themselves as African, okay? So my point of departure is militant struggle as a source of political unity across the African diaspora. In the 90s, a Haitian anthropologist wrote a book called Haiti, State Against Nation, The Roots and Origin of Duvalierism. Rather than blaming Haitians for the despair caused under the Duvaliers, he examines the structural and ideological roots of capitalism to reveal why Haitian leaders turn against the nation's majority. He argues this concept of the nation did not exist before the Haitian Revolution. In fact, it is the revolution that transformed hundreds of specific African ethnic groups into one throbbing revolutionary body that we now know as Haiti. Haiti's only post-colonial predecessor, the United States, had a common language, religion, and governance for hundreds of years in Europe before colonizing the Americas. Haitians did not have that benefit before independence. Nearly 60 to 75 percent of the people who fought in the Haitian Revolution were born in Africa. As an example, look around you. In 1791, when your revolutionary ancestors, because the Haitian Revolution was for all Africans, not just the Africans who became Haitian. When your revolutionary ancestors fought for their liberation, only one out of every three was born on what the indigenous Taino called Aiti. So Aiti is the indigenous native name of the island, and it means land of mountains. Imagine that those same people, so we're, we're in a very crowded space, count one, two, three. Each third person does not speak the same language, but those people came together to fight against French, British, and Spanish imperialism, and that fight continues on today. The issue of language is very important when we're thinking about the African diaspora. So though I do not speak Swahili, English is my second language, and I'm forgetting my first language, so I don't think Swahili is going to be on the list, but Swahili, because of the number of Africans who speak it, and the millennia that Swahili came into formation because of trade with Arab traders, people in the Indian Ocean, it has become a lingua franca for Africans all over the world. So, there is a holiday in the U.S. called Kwanzaa, and it uses Swahili and principles from East Africa to unite us under pan-African principles. Invasion is not a pan-African principle. So, going back to the Haitian Revolution, one of the early leaders is complaining to one of his French bosses. And he writes, most of my soldiers quote, for the most part can scarcely make out two words of French, but who above all were accustomed to fighting in their country. I want to emphasize the point here. Accustomed to fighting in their country reveals his awareness that his African-born soldiers had extensive military experience before they arrived in the Americas. Another thing that I want to point out here 
Muslims, the first Muslims in the Americas were African people. And we see the role of Muslims not only in the Haitian Revolution, but in liberation struggles in places like Brazil. It was the skillful work of military generals who coordinated the military talent of your revolutionary ancestors. With each unthinkable victory over the Spanish, British, and finally the French, Africans who became Haitians, Africans became Haitians in a 13-year war. So the Haitian Revolution did not happen overnight. It took 13 years. Once they got their independence, they fought against each other for another two decades. So I want us to understand the people your sons, your daughters are going to encounter in the next, uh, in the next year. The top three regions where our Africans were stolen from are West and West Central Africa, the Bight of Benin, and the Bight of Biafra. Haitians before the revolution came from nations that post-colonialism calls the Congo, Ghana, Togo, Benin, Nigeria, Cameroon, and Gabon. I am stressing the point of the variety of African people who would become Haitian, because in many ways, we continue to become Haitian as we continue to identify ourselves as African based on different and similar experiences of imperialism and slavery. Early Haitian statesmen were aware of the trauma and factionalism caused by slavery, the middle passage from Africa, and decades of war. So I just want to give a little bit of context. The Middle Passage is not simply the moment that enslaved Africans got on the boat and got to the Americas. That voyage itself took three months. But before they were shoved into those boats, they had to be kidnapped from the interior parts. So sometimes walking from the interior, so the majority of people who became Haitian come from the Congo. Walking from the Congo, to the Atlantic Ocean takes about four months. Then they would be put in slave dungeons until they had a sufficient number of enslaved bodies to put on the ship. That could take anywhere from six months to a year. So this thing that we call the Middle Passage is anywhere from two to three years of accidental genocide. So for the people who survived the Middle Passage, they are wrestling with all of those things, and then on top of it, their bodies are brutalized to birth capitalism. And when it comes to women, to enslaved African women, not only did they work on the fields, they literally used their reproductive labor, their bodies, birth new people into slavery, and those traumas remain as part of the African-American consciousness. When I say African-American, I mean everything from Canada all the way down to Argentina, because Africans were in the Americas before nation states existed, okay? So let me just skip around a little bit. All right. Um, 220 years later, Haitians on the island and across the diaspora continue to cultivate feelings of nationhood. Whether it's Independence Day in January, Boakaima in August, so Boakaima was the religious political meeting where all of these Africans who did not speak the same language made a blood oath that we are going to abolish slavery. And, and I want to bring up the Muslims again, because two of those leaders, one of their names was um, Cecile Fatima, and the other person's name was Bukma. We know that they were Muslim, because Fatima is a very traditional Muslim name, and Bukma, um, they called him Bukma because he was always carrying around a Quran. So he was the book man, okay? So these two Muslims, they're the leaders of this uh, revolutionary meeting, and they sacrifice a pig. Do I have any Muslims in the audience? We don't touch pigs, right? So for two Muslims, what does that say about how serious they were 
We're going to use a pig, something that is haram in our religion, to demonstrate how serious we are about getting the white colonizers out. I'm skipping around a little bit. Okay, okay. We here in this room have an important role to play in cultivating community through disciplined effort. I challenge us to use the Haitian Revolution as a tool to understand Haitians and also to understand ourselves. Uh, because I am a historian of the Atlantic world, my knowledge of Kenyan history is very limited, but one of the things I recall distinctly were women during the colonial, no, excuse me, during the, during the Mau Mau Rebellion. The British decided, in partnership with Christian groups, to ban female circumcision. And some young Kenyan women said, how dare you? Because in our culture, if we are uncircumcised, we are not seen as proper adults, proper people in our society. And in resistance to British colonialism, they decided to cut themselves. That is the powerful resistance against imperialism, and it is something that Haitians and Kenyans share in common. Okay, let me see, all right. So uh, to fast forward to what's happening today, um, in January, the Biden administration announced an uh, immigration plan for Haitians, although some folks were hopeful about it, I wasn't, and eight months later, I, I am unfortunately correct in that the U.S. wants to limit immigration into the country. And they know that if they send U.S. soldiers to Haiti, the U.S. will be culpable for the Haitian migrants who are pushed out. Enter Kenya, a country that is literally over 20 hours away from Haiti. So whatever happens in Haiti in relationship to the Kenyan, um, to the U.S. finance Kenyan invasion, Haitians are not going to be coming to your borders. There is, a, there is plausible deniability about what is going to happen. But people who are willing to sacrifice pigs when they're Muslims are not going to tolerate imperialism that is dressed in the face of a brother or a sister. So, uh, let me see. All right. Um, so, the, the main point here is the U.S. is financing to the tune, I think, of $200 million in arms deal to Kenya in order to not have more immigrants come into the country. Not because the U.S. does not like immigrants, but the immigration debate loses elections. So your sons and daughters who will be going to Haiti, they're going to Haiti for an election process that has nothing to do with Kenyan lives. I translate this type of political buffoonery for Haitian arrivals. I do a lot of translation work in my community. It is, um, uh, I am a Haitian immigrant. I was born in Haiti. My first language is, is Haitian Creole. So I'm always translating. And when I translate for these new Haitian arrivals, they stare at my third degree burns compassionately, asking me what they should do. I can only offer the community-based tactics that helped my family avoid jail after my burn accident and 13 years of organizing with Brooklyn-based Haitians. On 12 January 2010, I sat barefoot on a Haitian balcony that overlooked a drained pool surrounded by fire red trees. It kind of looks like the little purple flower trees that you got, but it's just red. My toes lapped up the cool from the linoleum floor while I cracked jokes with an Iraq war veteran who had been deported from the US. So she fights in the Iraq war and then they kick her out anyway. In a flash, I see the erosion of her laughter lines. The eyes gain depth through horror. She saw something just beyond my shoulder. 
Before I turn, just like that, the Earth's eggshell cracked and solid ground crumbled away. For 35 seconds, we surfed on membrane and quivering yolk. The once sturdy lilonium floor juts up in coarse, impossibly jagged angles. Before completely falling apart, the floor politely allowed the furniture over the balcony's edge. In disbelief, I retreated into the brain's attic. This is what professors do. We live in our heads. Allowing it to sort through memories of bumpy train rides. It took an empty bookcase careening toward my body to snatch my brain back into reality. I realized there are no trains in Haiti. That rumble was the cavernous bowel of the earth demanding tribute in the form of life and property. The cement created an opaque cloud that tasted of soft talcum powder with sporadic dashes of shard. I belly crawled away from the balcony's ledge toward the veteran's voice. I made myself vertical by clutching onto the mighty calves of a hero barking life-saving orders at me. Still silent, I watched Mother Earth reclaim her children. For the record, the first first responders to the seven-point magnitude earthquake were our survivors. Their bulldozer-like fingers desperately moved mountains of cement for the buried living. Haitians describe the hollow bouncing sound and feel of crunching cement as the onomatopoeic gudu gudu. So that's the sound, that's what it sounds like. For 36 hours, survivors endured thunderbolts zinging our feet from the earth's open bowels. Still, still, we continue to hear the choir of pitiful shrieks from children, men, and women. 13 years later, these survivors migrate to the United States. They assume my burn scars are from the gudu gudu when I do translation work. To explain this tragedy happened in the United States might diminish Hope's extraordinary power. So my family migrated to the US. I have this terrible accident. And my family, they don't speak English. They're terrified that we would be deported. So instead of taking me to the hospital, they tried to treat me at home. I am not a mother, but for all of the mothers, for all of the parents, for all of the caregivers, can you imagine what type of fear you have to hold to let your child endure that type of suffering? This is the reality of black immigrants in the US. Like 2010's first responders, Kenyans who arrived to my homeland play a role in shaping Haiti's future. The toddler version of the earthquake survivor finally understands fearful immigrants make horrific decisions to remain within US borders. What horrific decisions will Kenya's leader make while in Haiti? What will Kenyan voters do to challenge that? Our governments, both here and in Haiti, destroyed the social contract. Democracy is an experiment. If you don't believe so, just look at how the US is absolutely crumbling before our eyes, and yet they propose that this model should be imposed on everyone. Our brothers and sisters in West Africa, they are challenging it through coups, but we need to be clear, the reason they are challenging it is that they are still financing the economy of France even though they have been independent for nearly, or no, for over half a century at this point. The death of Kenyans and Haitians is inevitable. I offer the following options. First, jeter de l'eau. That is a Haitian expression which means poor libations for the estimated 300,000 ancestors who were born on the day of the earthquake and the ancestors who will be born due to this disastrous invasion plan. Second, poor libations in form of tears for yourself. Some of the men and women who will be going will not come back 
and we need to prepare to honor their memory so that we never allow our leaders to make this type of decision again. And finally, put your hands in the work. My mother has a lovely uh, parable she would say, um, hold on, I'm translating. Uh, the hands, no, the eyes are coward before the eyes. So this is an expression she would say before I had to clean up my room. She's like, don't look at it, just put your hands in the work. So that is what I'm suggesting to people in this audience. Put your hand in this work. We cannot allow this invasion to transform Kenya. The speakers of Swahili, the Pan-African lingua franca, to become an imperial power in Haiti. How will our prayer warriors and educators guide our young people during this uh, proposed invasion? If Haiti has offered anything to global humanity, it is the fierce truth that unity brings powers. May this history anchor us during the hard times ahead. Thank you.